Bavesh Patel will lead this last uh, session. Bavesh is an expert in complexity, which you'll hear, hear a little bit more about. Um, and Bavesh will take us through the through the journey and give us specific uh, things we we can do uh, in our lives, but also in our organizations, because it has become increasingly difficult to plan what we're going to do if we don't know if we'll be able to leave our houses in uh, two weeks. Um, so yes, Bavesh, tell us how to embrace uncertainty. Thanks, Maya. Um, so maybe uh, I'll say a couple of words about myself. So I'm sitting here in Moldova, um, but uh, I'm from the UK. My um, parents uh, were actually born in Africa. My grandparents in India, which explains a little bit of the skin color. Um, and, you know, expertise and complexity. I mean, it's a, it's a bit of a paradox. I'm not sure you can have expertise and complexity. But I've been working for quite a few years now with um, different types of networks. So working with um, cultural actors who are working on social change, working with um, frontline humanitarian negotiators, um, and, and working with Wikipedia on its um, strategic future and, and how to make free knowledge available to everyone. Um, all of those things are ridiculously messy. Um, and so I've been trying to work with complexity ideas to, to better understand them. So, um, yeah, I'm going to share a few ideas. Um, so let's go to my slides and let's, let's see if this works. Okay. Yeah, they're looking pretty good. So next slide. So, um, yeah, funny title, uh, uncertainty loves you. Um, I'll explain a bit more what I mean by that. And so, um, yeah, I'm going to try and share a few ways of thinking and acting that might be useful. And I imagine maybe you're already doing it, but maybe uh, my uh, sharing might make it more explicit. Um, click. Ah, yeah. Uh, you might have to go whole screen because um, I like to put information on slides, not to kill you by PowerPoint, as the phrase goes, um, but more so that um, if you actually prefer reading, then you can listen to me and you can read something as well. So click. All right. So um, in a strange way, I, I listened to Marta this morning, and I think a lot of things I'm going to share are almost identical to Marta, but, but maybe the language is a little bit different. So let's start a bit with inner complexity, meaning let's start with us or let's start with moi. Uh, let's start with you. So next slide. Okay, so um, I want to point out five things that are connected to our evolutionary development. Um, there'll be a whole video um, about this on, on house base, but I, I just want to give a kind of short summary here that helps us understand anxiety a little bit more. So uh, click. So the first one, um, and Marta mentioned this, is we love to create simple stories. Um, homo narrens. So instead of homo sapiens, homo narrens or the storyteller or the meaning maker. And so... Uh, we uh, all of our knowledge has developed through stories which, which of course is good but there is also this interesting danger that we have which is you give someone a couple of pieces of information and we instinctively make a story out of it whether that story has any truth or not is a secondary point we we can't stop ourselves from creating meaning even when there's no meaning there or that's the wrong meaning so one of the challenges we have is we love to create a simple story. Uh, click. The next one, uh, we want to be right. And so that's just pointing to this, to this need um, to, to feel like, again, the simple story and it's right or I know something. Click. The next one, we agree so that we can stay in the group. And there's an, an interesting idea that in our evolution, we, of course, have lived in groups, have lived in tribes. And when you're outside of the tribe in, in the very old days, you know, there's a chance that you might, might die. So you need the tribe to survive. And so we have this inbuilt desire 
to be liked, um, to be in the group. And we're actually at some level scared of disagreeing sometimes in case we face exclusion. So we, we have this fear of exclusion. Click. We like being in control. Well, maybe there's not more to say there. I mean, when things make sense, when things are in order, um, when things feel logical, um, we like to have a feeling that, that we understand something or, or we're, on, we're in control. Um, click. Yeah. And um, we have a, a natural, you could call it resistance to change. Um, and, and what really all I mean by that is this feeling of uh, starting with the assumption that I'm okay, I'm okay. Um, and then we kind of have a bit of a resistance to then going, ah, oh, actually, you know, maybe it's me that needs to change. Um, click. So the opposite of all these things can create anxiety. So it's one way to think about what generates anxiety. What happens when the story's not simple, it's complex, and I don't actually understand what's going on? I can feel anxious. What happens when actually I'm wrong, and maybe someone tells me wrong, or the events prove me wrong? I can feel anxious. What happens, especially in uncertain times, when we have to disagree with each other? So possibly we can learn something. So disagreement as a way of discovering more information so we can learn together. I can feel anxious. What happens when, I think like all of us now, we are feeling more and more out of control, not know what's happening. I feel anxious. And what happens when all of this is going on and I start to realize that part of the challenge is the changes I need to make in my own attitude, in, in my values, whatever those changes are. Hey, none of us like to change. So again, I feel anxious. So it's just recognizing these are, are five points that, that have actually supported our evolutionary development, but also can get in the way of how we deal with uncertainty because they can all make us very, very anxious. Click. So the question then is, how are you developing your relationship with uncertainty? And this goes back to the, the title, which is um, maybe for some of us, uncertainty is new. I, I don't think so anymore. Maybe for some of us, uncertainty is a colleague that I occasionally meet. Maybe for some of us, uncertainty has started to become a friend that annoyingly seems to have stayed over too long. And maybe for some of us, uncertainty is something I'm starting to fall in love with. Now that might sound a little bit too far, but um, the next months and the next years are probably going to be um, continuing uncertainty, maybe continuing crisis. And so something very practical we can actually do is really start thinking about how do I develop my relationship with uncertainty? Um, there are hundreds of practices for, for how to do that, um, but the, 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 the focus or the practice still remains of developing that relationship with uncertainty and the anxiety that comes with it rather than avoiding it. Click. So um, one thing I would say is uh, it takes courage to face the unknown. It takes courage to be kind to yourself. Um, I'll just repeat that, to be kind to yourself when you feel anxious and uncertain. And, and here's an interesting one. Uh, it takes courage to choose not knowing. So again, this is something practical we can do. It sounds really strange. Our first reaction to uncertainty is to find out what to do. What's the solution? Uh, how can I know more? And sometimes you can jump to a solution that actually is the wrong one. And that's actually a practice to practice more not knowing, to hold off on the solution, to be a little bit more uh, curious uh, before deciding on what you understand about something. So again, it's the same thing, this practice of choosing not to know rather than jumping at the solution. Um, click. So it takes courage to stay open and work with our stress of not being in control. It takes courage to welcome different perspectives and the unexpected. And 
all of that's coming. Um, and maybe most importantly, uh, we need the support of others to do it. So there's, so even though for some of us, we may be in lockdown, locked in our houses, possibly alone in a, in a physical sense, um, there's absolutely no way you can deal with uncertainty by yourself, that there is no way, which is probably obvious. Um, but for someone like me, if I talk about myself, um, it's not easy always for me to, to reach out to others, to, to share my vulnerability, to actually ask for help. But if we're going to survive uncertainty and if we're going to address our anxiety, um, my view, my view is that we can't do it alone and we actually need the, the support of each other. And there's a little bit of good news here. So uh, click. Click again. Yeah, great. Um, we also need to find the complexity master deep inside us. And Marta said a few times this phrase, the, the wisdom deep inside. And, and it, it, again, maybe an obvious point, but actually, um, were any of you planning to be at this megaphone on the day you were born? Was I planning to give a presentation uh, today, the day I was born? I mean, of course not. So many things of our lives were actually completely unpredictable. And so from one point of view, we're, we're living in a kind of permanent state of uncertainty. And at some level, we're, we're happy with that and we just carry on and then we call it life. And then in other areas, maybe where we're organizing things, where we're running projects, where we're working in groups, for some reason, we want uh, more order, we want more control, uh, we want to know how it all happens. Um, but yet somewhere deep inside us, uh, maybe at that archetypal Jungian level that Marta talked about, um, I do believe we're all complexity masters, if we can find that space inside of us. So, uh, click. All right, we'll, we'll just pause there, maybe for 60 seconds or, or maybe a bit less. Um, have a look below the live stream and uh, two questions should be popping up. Maybe they're already there. What makes you anxious and how do you work with anxiety? So I'll just pause there for a minute or a bit less than a minute and then continue. <laughs> the, the second question, how do you work with your uncertainty? Um, I mean, whether you fill it in now or later, if we can start to collect tips, links, techniques, approaches, it's one way to support each other to start making a, a big list. Um, <laughs> I like what, what makes you uh, anxious and someone put uncertainty, yeah. <laughs> All right, let's continue. Uh, click. All right, so we, uh, in a way, we touched just very briefly on what I would call inner complexity because we're we're complex beings. Um, but now let's look at outer complexity, or um, uh, let's look at the different types of domains we can experience. So, so I want to give you. Um, yeah, it's not really, yeah, maybe theory, it's it's a framework. Um, it's called the Kenevin framework. Um, I'm going to present it in a, in a slightly different way. Um, and again, I'm going to add videos later in, in English and in Russian, um, if you want to sort of get into the details. So, so click. So what this framework recognizes is um, that there are three, three, well, there are five types of domains. I'm going to stick to three. One of these domains, it's a bit like a traffic light, which means the domain is the one called clear. It's clear, simple, and obvious what you should do. Red means stop, green means go, yellow means wait. So you just do it. There are rules to follow. Um, you just need a checklist to help you do something. And so this is the domain where best practice 
actually work. So very simple thing like signing up for a webinar. So if things are clear and some things are clear, it is the place where you can set some rules and you can use best practice and a checklist will help. So that's the clear domain, click. Now, some things are not clear, they're complicated. So there's one picture there of a jigsaw. Um, a jigsaw has a solution. It just might take you a lot of time or analysis to find the solution. But if something's complicated, there is a solution. Now that's the jigsaw picture. The other picture is an inside of a computer. I know nothing about fixing computers. Um, so for me, computers are a mystery, but there are experts who have dedicated their time to learning how to fix computers or, or fix cars or build bridges. Um, and so they use their expertise. And like with a jigsaw or possibly with, a, with a, the inside of a computer, there isn't one way to fix it. There might be a few ways to fix it. So it's not best practice, it's good practice. Good practice mean, meaning there's a few ways to, to solve the problem. Best practice basically means the answer is universal. So actually there's not many things that are, that are best practice, although we use that phrase a lot. So good example is, as I said, fixing a car, building a bridge. Uh, these things are complicated, sometimes very complicated, but expertise can help or analysis can help. Okay, we, I should be putting you to sleep by now because these two worlds you know. So the third one, click. So I hope that GIF's working. So this one's, it's complex, try something. So just take a look at that GIF with the, the little uh, um, bikes moving around. So are there rules? Well, doesn't look like it. Are there processes? Well, well, maybe, maybe there are. There is like a traffic system there, but I don't think anyone's following it. And so in a way, when things are complex, we have to move from, <coughs> from rules and processes, we have to move to principles. So what do I mean by that? I imagine, I'm guessing here, if I look at these bikes, when you arrive at that crossing, one principle would be slow down. Another principle would probably be deal with things that are in front of you. Um, another principle might, might be don't look backwards. Um, and so essentially with some principles, you start to experiment and through experimenting, you discover practice. So they're, they're probably, when, when something's complex and uncertain, there probably isn't a best practice because there's no universal solution. And I think Marta said that as well. Um, maybe there's good practice, but it's hard to know whether it's gonna work or not. Um, expertise become advice. So experts still might be useful, but now they're giving you uh, advice that they can't be 100% sure. And so you need to therefore um, experiment to discover what's gonna work. And most human systems by default are complex just because we're complex. And you know, I could give you lots of examples, but the simplest one now is Corona uh, in the sense that so many concepts have now come together um, has um, the intersectionality of it as, as uh, someone shared earlier that has just created this complexity. And at all levels, we're now struggling, experimenting, trying to discover what are the new practices um, through experimentation that are gonna help us work with complexity. So these are three different domains. Um, there's no right or wrong here, and there's no good or bad here. It's just recognizing um, a, a very nice phrase, contextual applicability, which, which simply means um, try and use the right method in the right context um, because using the wrong method in the wrong context will probably lead to disaster. So it's kind of recognizing, well, nothing's fundamentally right or wrong, um, but it's more about understanding which context you're in and then using the appropriate uh, method. I'll say a bit more about that. Um, click. All right, that, that was another chunk of information. So we'll stop there again, maybe just for 30 seconds. Um, another couple of questions should have popped up in, in the house space. Uh, this one is uh, 
in which domain do you feel more comfortable to work? Uh, it's a poll, I think. And the other one is in which domain does most of your work feel like it is? So I'll just give you maybe 30 seconds to to work. I mean, you, you don't have to answer the polls. You can actually just sit back and relax or you can answer them. But yeah. Oh yeah, I th I have a feeling with this one, I don't, I think probably Anna has to press something and then we see the results of the poll. So may maybe we'll look at the results later. Okay, so uh, the poll will stay open. You can You can click on it. Maybe we'll look at the results in a bit. All right, let's carry on a bit. Uh, next slide. <laughs> so, uh, oh, I, I need to submit an answer myself. Ah, some information in from Anna. I'm just going to answer the poll myself to see if it helps. In which domain do I feel more comfortable? All right, I'll say that. And I'll say that. Ah, okay, now the poll's popped up. Uh huh. Hmm. More comfortable in clear and most work in complex. That's uh, going to cause a bit of stress. All right. Um, so what the hell? No. So how the hell is uh, all of what I've shared useful? So um, uh, I'd now like to offer um, different ways of thinking about how you can sort of respond to complexity. Um, I'm going to contrast it with simple and complicated because um, one of my learning styles is when I contrast something, um, it makes it easier to understand. It doesn't always mean it's true, but sometimes contrasting and generalizing just helps um, see things a bit more clearly. So click. All right. So there's three of these slides. The first one is what kind of situation is this so it's going back to that that those three of uh, clear uh complicated and complex so what kind of situation is this now if it's simple or complicated click it's uh, i'll just go through this very quickly it, it's predictable this cause and effect you know how this works if i do this then this will happen you have therefore control. You can actually plan change. You can manage change, change management. And what worked before, maybe with some adjustment, will probably work again. So that you know this world, and it's the, the world of, of project management, uh, whether project management works or not, and whether long, log frames work or not is a different point, um, but it's the world of project, project management. Now, that's the world we kind of know or used to know. What about the complex world? So click. Oh. So uh, obviously it's unpredictable. Why? Well, there's just too many things interconnected uh, and we don't see all the connections and we don't even see half of the things that are connected to each other and they're always changing. That, that concept is called co-evolution. Um, everything's moving and co-evolving with each other, and that is also called non-linear. Uh, and some would add non-causal, but that's a, a more philosophical debate. Um, how change happens can only be understood after it has happened. Now, now that seems like a strange sentence, but um, uh, I can't remember the, the lady's name, but, but the, the lady who talks about Poland, um, what she said was, is I can tell you where it started, I can tell you where we are, but I can't tell you where it's going. But when it started, she couldn't even tell you where it was going, right? And so this interesting idea that change is retrospective. When we're in uncertain environments, we are trying to act, we are trying to do our best. And what happens is, we then later afterwards, we look back and we see, oh yeah, right, this happened, this happened, this happened. 
and retrospectively we can tell a story of change but when we're actually in the change process when it's complex you actually don't know you don't know so change becomes retrospective it, it's much harder to plan well you can't plan it you can try and uh what worked before will probably not work again that that should be obvious um because it's consistently changing and so whatever worked before will work again if nothing has changed or changed a little bit but if things are fundamentally changing all the time then what worked before is very unlikely to work again um if it does it's more luck than uh than good planning now the, the challenge is um i'm probably not saying anything new um i've been working with these complexity ideas for 10 years and still if i'm honest secretly i dream of order i still want things to be a bit more controlled i still want to be able to know if i do this then this will happen so i'm not saying for all of us but certainly for many of us like me there is still this secret desire for <laughs> more control and more order even though intellectually uh yeah i just know that it's not like that so the big challenge is actually uh learning to really work with complexity because if you take this seriously then you have to start working differently which i'm coming to so click uh i need to let go all this attachment to order is killing me and it's just again what i said uh and someone i think someone said this earlier one of the biggest dangers is um doing something simple uh something clear or something complicated in a complex environment right i'll just repeat that so you just do uh something that you think okay this worked before this will work again let's just do it it works every time and you simplify the complex situation and usually it's 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 going to end up in catastrophe if you want the simplest example um so i said that i'm born in the uk so still still british to some extent here's the simplest example it's like david cameron all right well let's just shut all these people up and have a referendum on whether we should leave europe yeah that's pretty simple i mean no one's actually gonna vote let's leave europe so i'll just have a referendum we'll just count the votes and we're done um that was a classic simple or simplistic response to what should have been a very complex question that needed to be treated very differently and anyway if you're from the uk you know where we are now and yeah for the rest of europe as well okay click okay so uh uh what's the situation this one is so what can i understand about it now if it's simple or complicated click we know what to do define your focus area um, use analysis or, or whatever research methods you can basically create a model of the system you know how it works and then you plan your change blah 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 okay more interesting what do we do when it's complex how can we understand Cl oh click sorry <laughs> So I'll, I'll go through these slowly. I know it's a bit of text there, but I'll, I'll go through them slowly. So everything is so connected. You have to make a choice about where you want to start and be ready to change and adapt. And it just means if you look at a complex situation, um, there's so many interconnections. It's like, OK, well, this affects this community, but actually it's connected to the political situation and ah, it's connected to the economic situation. And actually, this community has been discriminated for such a long time now, and there are cultural. And you can just keep analyzing it. And because it's complex, it's so interconnected that the story will just get bigger and bigger. And so you have to make a subjective choice as a group, uh, wh whoever's working on it, usually maybe with the people you're working with, ideally, about what is the boundary within which we're now going to try something, but keep those boundaries flexible, keep those boundaries permeable, because whatever scope of practice you choose, you're probably going to have to change and adapt. Uh, and that's fine, because you've all accepted complexity now. So of course, it's going to change. Um, the next point, so stories. Stories become very rich sources of data 
because when you're working in complexity and you're working with human systems, context matters, history matters, beliefs matter, feelings matter, and all of these things start to become uh, essential. Because when you're working with complex change in human systems, what people actually think and what communities think and what's happened to them before really is important to take into account. Um, someone's already mentioned intersectionality, so I, I don't need to repeat that word. Um, another one, you can Google this one, is trans-contextual or warm data is another word. And it's just all it's recognizing, very big words for, for in a way, a simple idea for me, transcontextual is just recognizing the absolute interconnection or intermingling of all contexts. Um, give a very simple example of that. A couple of days ago, I was in a warm data lab, which is a, a method for, for working with transcontextuality. And um, the topic I had was family, history, and law. And at first it was like, okay, how do these three connect? And in the most simplest ways, I'm thinking, should I go home to the UK to see my family? Um, why? Well, it's Christmas and we have a tradition. We're not, we're not Christian, but anyway, we have a tradition of meeting uh, every Christmas. So that's history now. And then it's like, well, actually, depending on the lockdown, will I be allowed to visit my family? Um, because of the, the, you're not allowed, even allowed to travel in the country. Um, and that's law. So even a simple thing like visiting my family, so many contexts um, come into play. Another thing that becomes important are other ways of knowing. Um, so the use of art, which, which we've already seen, um, the use of theater, and, and I could go on. But rather than classically and objectively, uh, from an expert point of view, doing an analysis, I'm not saying that's not useful, I'm saying analysis and expertise becomes a perspective and then there are other perspectives that now become equally important so stories become the stories of people become very rich sources of data and the final one uh, you will never understand everything so decide what is enough understanding to start taking action if you keep analyzing you'll analyze forever and that's analysis paralysis um, and so uh, this is an interesting idea. We need to start acting our way into new thinking, not thinking our way into new acting. And I'll just repeat it. We need to act our way into new thinking and there acting on intuition, which, which Marta also mentioned becomes important. And, and uh, it's not exactly the same, but when you get a chance, Google abductive logic. So this inductive deductive abductive logic recognizes that you can see a bunch of random things and intuitively put them together and see something that might be important. Um, so also called the theory of hunches. So ab abductive logic um, as a form of intuition is kind of recognized as, as a way of working. When things are complex, your mind sometimes puts a few things together and just goes, ah, oh, I, think, I think this might be it. And it's almost, it's more at an intuitive level rather than a, a rational level. Okay, next slide. Uh, one is only truly creative when there are no more options. And that's just, just recognizing that as much as we love the simple and ordered world can also get a bit boring. And so there's also something creative that happens when we're, we're pushed into complexity. Next slide, I'll start wrapping up soon. I'm sure Maya is uh, tapping on her watch. Um, uh, click. All right, this side, you know, simple and complicated. So what can you do to change something? So logical long-term planning, goals, outcomes, focus on efficiency, uh, which again was already mentioned. Things shouldn't fail. So the word robustness means things shouldn't fail. So get them efficient, uh, save time, save money, et cetera, do it right. Uh, centralized coordination, because you know what you're doing. So hierarchy comes in there. Okay, complex. Oh, click, click, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so now what shifts here? So instead of focusing on goals, focus on a direction 
defined by what you want to see more of and less of. You can't define in complexity exactly where you want to get to, but you can define a direction. So, so my partner's working with uh, homelessness in Moldova. And so you can say, okay, we want to reduce uh, homelessness in Moldova. We want to reduce the number of people on the streets. Now, that is a direction. It's not saying exactly what the goal is, and it's not saying by when you'll reach the goal, but it is giving a direction for, for action. And then uh, you can start working in that direction. And stories, again, can be really useful because you, if you find stories that uh, are examples of what you want to see more of, and there are stories uh, that are examples of what you want to see less of, then a strategic conversation doesn't have to be so abstract. A strategic conversation can be, how can we have more stories like that? How can we have less stories like that? And, and anyone can answer that question. So you set a focus uh, on a direction, and then you use multiple safe to small, safe to fail, safe to try experiments. That's a mouthful. Multiple small, safe to try experiments. Multiple, just because you don't know what's going to work, so you try out many things. Small, small because failure and unintended consequences are guaranteed. So you're guaranteed to fail, but failure actually is not failure. It's actually learning because you're learning what not to do. And someone mentioned resilience earlier. Resilience is the ability to fail, get up and keep trying. So systems that are resilient are designed for failure. I'll say that again. Systems that are resilient are actually designed for failure because failure is learning. Um, and safe to try, because if you do something big and it goes wrong, then it could end up being a big failure and you don't know what's going to work. So, so start small. And focus on effectiveness, not efficiency. So what's the difference? Effectiveness is not worried about uh, how well you're doing something. Effectiveness is asking, are you even doing the right thing? Is this actually making any difference? If it is making a difference, sure, grow it. If it's not making a difference, reduce it in some way. Um, so effectiveness is focusing on, uh, am I actually getting the results that I want? Am I moving in the direction that I want? Yes or no? Um, and maybe this one, the last one doesn't need any more. Distribute action and power. Someone already mentioned that. More people trying things locally and in context. Uh, click. So, um, era, yeah, everything I shared can be used for increasing or decreasing societal and planetary health. So, you know, <laughs> in simplistic terms, what I'm sharing, the good guys or the bad guys, I mean, however you want, whatever phrase you want to use, both can use these uh, strategies. Uh, I'm just going to move on. I think I'm going to wrap up because I'm, I'm hitting time. Uh, so I'm click. So I'm just going to leave you with it with an interesting image. This is just me thinking about stuff. Um, so click. So here's the dinosaurs. You know that story with the uh, meteor. Um, and uh, the dinosaurs had grown to such a level that they had essentially started shaping the environment around them, which means them and the environment were absolutely connected, which means when the meteorite hit, the environment radically changed, but they were now no, no longer able to change. They were brittle or they were fragile. So I wonder whether some of the things that we are now seeing is these huge global systems are kind of like the dinosaurs that have grown to such a level of brittleness and interconnectedness with the environment. Corona, like a meteor, has radically shifted the environment. And we are starting to see these things shake, go into crisis, maybe start collapsing. So maybe we're in this kind of scenario. I don't mean extinction. <laughs> I just mean that some of these big dinosaur systems and institutions um, are really possibly on the edge of collapse. Um, click. At the same time, you probably know this story, while these dinosaurs uh, were, uh, were moving towards extinction, that small animal there, the little furry mammal, which the dinosaur thought it was protecting, ends up taking advantage of this new environment and the little furry mammal uh, eventually becomes us and, and, and a whole bunch of other creatures. 
click. So here, here's my final slide and final image. You've got a dominant system uh, crashing here, click. So there's the dinosaurs. And maybe here's another way of thinking about collapsing systems. How do we care for the collapsing systems or how do we care for the dying dinosaurs? How do we hospice that which is dying? So not see it as something we need to tear down. It does need to collapse maybe, but how do we care for that which is dying? At the same time, click. There's that little furry mammal or those small innovations which are always there, but now their time has come. So click. So how do we create space for the new ideas to grow? And this is like the double challenge of making space for new ideas to grow, caring for the, the dying systems or the dying dinosaurs and click. Maybe the new system emerges and if we make that transition and we, we kind of have to make that transition, um, we then move into whatever that, that new world is. Um, and so I just finish with this uh, simple phrase, believe you can change the world, believe you can change the world, because at the end of the day, it does come back to uh, hope, it comes back to humor, and it comes back to what you actually believe is possible. Mm -hmm.